Good morning, good morning, church. Hey, Amen. I need a few volunteers here. Can I get a, pick a few raises of hands? A few people to raise their hands. Now, don't do anything until I tell you. Okay, a few people to raise their hands. Now, I need some people to catch. All right. Here we go, back row right there. All right. All right, Louise. Michelle. Can't see. Oh, uh, you know what? I got one more for you, Papi Stilos. All right. I'll set this down. Okay, before you do anything. Okay, now, what did I hand out? Okay, what, okay, how do you know? How do you know? Okay, now let me tell, I'm gonna give you guys a charge. Okay, now, when I say go, so do whatever you have to do to make it glow. Go. Whatever you gotta do to make it glow. Okay, awesome, everybody got them? Okay, guys, now hold them up. Now, what did you guys do to get it to glow? It had to be broken. Amen. Our title this morning is Glow Sticks Are Like Disciples, Brightest When Broken. Oh. Brightest When Broken. Oh. Glow Sticks Are Like Disciples. They're brightest when broken. You see, there's no way for it to be, without, without it being broken, it's just a stick. The light can't shine. And yet no one can tell if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. No one can see the light unless you're broken. Our theme text today will be in Luke chapter 7. Guys, i got to be honest with you. I'm a little fearful of those who don't take this message to heart. And i got to be honest with you, I'm fearful for those who do take this message to heart. Guys, in the Old Testament, prophecies were, to, were prophets got oracles, okay? They got an oracle. And literally in Hebrew, an oracle means a burdensome message. It means that they, God put a message on their heart that was not fun to preach. It was difficult to get the point across. And yet, God's put a serious oracle on my heart this week. That i got to be real with you. This sermon is offensive to Satan. This sermon is going to tick off the gates of hell. Satan, today, is going to erase every sermon preached in Long Beach because this one got his attention. So I would encourage you as well to tune in. This one right here is a tough one. You know, and I mean, just, I mean, we, we, we had an amazing fast just yesterday. I mean, it was incredible. We went on a church, the whole church fasted together. I mean, some of us don't fast, we slow. You know what I mean? Um, you know what I mean? I know I can be difficult in that area. And um, I mean, sometimes when you fast, you lose weight. You know, shout out to me. I've already lost two pounds by being under these prison lights. I forgot what it'd be like. I mean, I'm just like a rotisserie white boy, you know? Like a rotisserie, who wants white meat, you know? Man. <laughs> I'm losing some, some pounds right here. Shout out to me. Um, but guys, you know, I think it, we gotta, we got to be mindful of this, amen, that glow sticks are just like disciples. They're brightest when broken. They're brightest when broken. And, and I think we have to understand that, that God does not see color. God does not see race. I'm so thankful that this church does not see color, but we see kingdom. We do not see race. We only run the race he's called us to. Are you with me right here? We drop culture and pick up the kingdom. And that is what God is, is because in the kingdom of God, race does not matter, color does not matter. The only color that matters is red, because that's the color of the blood of Jesus Christ that covers all of us. Amen? I'm so thankful to be your guys' brother. Just to, just to know, even if I was baptized in Eugene, Oregon, uh, that was the same church. I mean, I, I went into the Portland church. And yet, from the day I was converted, I always had a family out here in Long Beach. I always had a family. And yet, when you get baptized in the kingdom of God and covered in the blood of Christ, that's the only color that matters. That anybody else covered in that blood, you're literally family. I mean, 
I'm your brother. Put me on your Christmas card. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, Kiara is going to get a bump from her family. Like, who's this white guy on your card? That's my brother. I didn't even know. I mean, it's just amazing. We're worshiping God, you know? Like, Shamika is going to put it on the card. Hey, sh hey, Mika, who's this white boy on your card? That's my brother. I mean, we're brothers in Christ, you know? And so, I mean, but that, think about that, that we're such family, you know what I mean? And that's what's amazing is that all these glow sticks have something in common. They're all lit up. They're all shining. And yet, how discouraging for the, bro for the glow stick that can't get broken, can't shine its light. And yet, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we all walk in the light as broken disciples. And yet, how sad is it when an individual is a glow stick but fails to glow? As disciples of Jesus Christ, tune your ears into this message this morning. You may leave broken. You may leave glowing, but all I want you to do is focus in on what it's going to take for you to break this morning. Luke chapter 7, we'll pick it up here in verse 36. This is a passage right here, and this is where Jesus was anointed by a sinful woman, and we're going to look at her heart and the kind of heart she had coming to Jesus. Now, Luke's gospel writes it a little different. Now, we all know the story of Mary and, of course, of, uh, of Martha. We know that story. But, but this was a, dim, a different kind of woman right here because this woman was unique according to Luke. He recorded this, and yet we're going to be able to dig into this passage here and find what was so special about this woman. In Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36, it says, Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. Let's pause right there. So it says that this, this woman was a known sinner, right? She lived a sinful life. Now, that's just the Jerusalem and first century way of saying she was a prostitute. Amen? So she lives a sinful life, and yet she has a year's worth of perfume, right? She has an alabaster jar of perfume, and it says in verse 38, she stood behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee, who had invited, saw this, he said to himself, note that, he said to himself, okay? He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him. And what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner, that she's a prostitute. Interesting. Point number one, broken so you can see. Broken so you can see. You know what's interesting right here is the woman was able to wash the dirt off of Jesus' feet with her tears. That's how much she was crying. The first step in brokenness, the first sign of brokenness, is tears. Period. Tears. And yet tears are very similar to rain, and they actually do the same justice. Now, when it, what's the best day to hike Mount Hollywood? What's the day, best day to go on a hike and hike a mountain? The day after it rains, because after it rains, it clears the entire ozone, and you're able to see things much, much clearer. Now, crying is of the similar justice, where... When you cry deep tears of brokenness, of well, where you're at in your life, if you can cry and find tears and pour them out, you can have a serious clarity of mind and see a lot farther to the future. Amen? And yet tears were what allowed this woman to see. She was broken so that she could see. See, until a disciple is broken, they can't really see what's going on around them. You can't really see it. My sub point for you is are you a glare or are you glowing? I'm going to be real with you. There's some disciples that are a shadow of death. They're walking corpses. There's no light. According to Luke, uh, later in Luke's gospel, it says that the eyes are the window to the soul. If you can see darkness in the eyes, how great is that darkness? And yet as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are light. God is light. In him there is no darkness. And yet as disciples, we are filled with God's light. So if it's not shining, it's because we're trying to mask ourselves. There's suffering covering his light. 
There's some kind of facade covering his light. And yet many people can be a glare or a shadow. They're kind of fired up kind of part of the time. They're kind of enthusiastic. They're kind of zealous sometimes. And yet we don't want that, do we? I mean, you didn't leave the sin on the world to, to be like half fired up the rest of your life, did you? I mean, you didn't leave the garbage in the world because, you know, because it wasn't that awesome and you knew you had to obey Jesus. No, you wanted to obey Jesus because it was the only way out. It was the only way to light. And yet you need to remember that, that you left the world of sin, you left the world of darkness for the light. You know, many people say, you know, I could get broken. Believe it or not, I know I should get broken. People say, I could, I should. They're like, yeah, I should. That would be a good idea. I should get broken, honestly. Like, I, don't, I, I haven't cried in a long time. I should get broken. They're like, man, I could get broken. I know that. I know what it takes. I know what I got to repent of. And you have to ask yourself, what's holding you back? You know, it's interesting because this woman brought an alabaster jar of perfume, a year's worth of perfume. What would a prostitute be doing with perfume? Would it matter to those who were taking advantage of her? Probably not. Could it be that this woman had a jar of perfume simply because it was the only thing worth investing her money in that could temporarily, temporarily cover the stench of how used she felt all the time? Could it be? And yet, I believe that she brought this perfume to Jesus not because he didn't smell good, not because he was hurting in the pits, you know what I mean? Not because he had B.O., although they didn't have Old Spice back then, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, not, I don't think that was it. I believe she brought the perfume to Jesus because it wasn't working. It wasn't working. And yet there are things in our life that we need to understand that we try to use external things to hold us together. The perfume was the only thing that could mask who she really was, how she was really feeling. And yet, if you know you should get broken and you know you could get broken, what do you need to do? You need to bring at the feet of Jesus everything you're trying to hold yourself together with. That's it. That's it. How many of us try to hold ourselves together? with a post on a news feed. That news feed will scroll on. Those likes will dwindle away. Who checks people's Instagram pictures two years ago? That's temporary. You see, she understood the source. She understood that Jesus was the only person who could give her internal cleansing. And you gotta ask yourself as a disciple, I'm, you gotta say, okay, am I done Am I done with external temporary fixes? Am I done with this little facade, kind of trying to be happy, kind of trying to smile, kind of trying to post pictures like my life's awesome, kind of, you know, giving into the impurity because you're so insecure that you actually die alone. So you want to get, you know, wanna, you want to, yeah, whatever it is, you're just, you're desperate for security. And yet this woman got broken so she could see. She got broken for clarity. You know, the Pharisees invited him, invited Jesus over. You know, Jesus was, such, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, so they're still kind of figuring him out, right? So, so Jesus gets baptized, right? The Spirit comes on him right there. I mean, he goes to the temple. He starts reading from Isaiah. He's like, yo, this scripture's prophet, you know, it's fulfilled in your hearing. Here I am. I'm in the building. You know, he starts walking on the pool. He's not swimming anymore. He's touching withered people's hands. They start stretching out. They're like, his name is Jesus. I mean, they're, they're bouncing around. He's doing all kinds of stuff. Jesus was the man. Are you with me right here? Jesus was the man. And, and the Pharisees are like, yo, this dude is cold. Yo, this guy's doing some real stuff. This guy's doing some real stuff right here. And they're like, hey, listen, what you're doing out there? Good stuff, man. Why don't you come over for some, some roasted manna, and we'll have you over to dinner. We got to get, get you over here. So he comes over, right? He comes over to, to, to the house. And all of a sudden, this woman barges in. Woman barges in and comes weeping at his feet. You know, she was so broken about her life. She was so broken. And yet she said, it said that she heard that Jesus was there. I believe it was because Jesus was not a man 
that was fire and brimstone preaching, but he was a man who would walk from person to person, and he would hang out with the, with the lowly. He would hang out with the sinners. He would hang out with people that, that smelled like smoke, that smelled like alcohol in our vernacular. And yet many of us don't want to hang around people like that. Like, man, that per- man that, that's not smoke. That's reefer. It smells like that. It smells terrible. And like, I don't know what that is. Like, are you, come on, you need a shower. And yet you smell like pride. You smell like pride. You know why you're not fruitful? It's because you don't talk to people that Jesus talked to. You're not broken about your life. The Pharisees stood and, guess what, guess what? I'm going to go on to my second point, because they actually knew this woman. And yet they, they were trying to wrap their heads around who this guy Jesus was, because they said, okay, well, we, they knew enough about the law to know what the Messiah would come. And he's like, okay, well, well, he's doing most of the stuff that we thought the Messiah would do, but he's just not doing it and performing the miracles to with the people that he thought we thought that he would be. He's not hanging out with the people we thought he would be. We have such a strong man hanging out with such broken people. You see, the broken hearts break hearts. Only a broken heart can break another heart. And there's no facade here. Jesus was not the man. He had such a broken heart for the world that he came here to find the broken people because how do you fix the world if you don't fix what's broken? And yet so many people come into a facade today, they know 30 different Jesuses. There's so many different Jesuses out there. Jesus, the cool guy. Jesus, the friend. Jesus, the patter on the back of homosexuals. Jesus, the guy who says drinking's okay as long as you're not, you know what, actually all drinking's okay. I mean, he turned water into wine, you know. I mean, you, and there's so many different Jesuses out there. There's so many different ideas. And the only Jesus I see was the guy who was hung out with the broken. The guy who made the broken shine. The guy who made the broken be filled with light. The guy who made the broken, those who were dark, lit up like a glow stick. Amen? That's the only Jesus I see. And yet, this woman was broken. There's a Chinese proverb. Speaking of rotisserie white boy, like me, if you want white meat, let me know. I'm getting toasted here. Um, but, but speaking of rotisserie, there's a Chinese proverb that says there, there, there was a Chinese proverb of this rotating disc with blades on it that they would put on an individual's heart. And every time there would be a sin, every time there would be a shortcoming, they'd turn the wheel on your heart. And yet, every time your conscience was seared, you would, every time you, you, you did something that hurt your conscience, it would put a tear on your heart to let you know that you did something wrong. And yet, the more things you do wrong, they keep on turning, they keep on turning, they keep on turning, it creates a rivet to the point where that rotisserie wheel of blades telling you that you're doing something wrong is going around and around and around and you don't even feel it anymore. That's intense. To be in the deepest sin of your life and not even know it. You can't even see it. I should get broken. I could get broken. You know, I think about when I first moved here. When I first moved here, it was my, on June 5th was Liz and I's six-month anniversary. So, I mean, we're almost in for three years now, and that was two and a half years ago. It was a long time, huh? I mean, so we first moved here. And I remember what it was like when we first moved here. We first moved here, and it was June 5th. And I remember at the end of August, I reached a point where my heart had gotten to a very bad place. I moved in, and much like Jordan, I felt very weak. I was not coming to strengthen, but to get strength. And yet many people looked at me in a, in a way that I was a source of strength. And I started to try to be something I was not. And I, I stepped out of the lifestyle. I stepped out of a really hard time in Portland. It was a very hard time in Portland where a couple of my best friends had fallen away, just a couple very difficult things, a couple of very difficult cases in the church. And I had moved here, and I needed a lot of help. And I started to act like something I wasn't, right? And it got to a point where I just started to stop praying because I felt so guilty. I literally just stopped praying for a couple months. Stopped, stopped praying. I mean, a couple prayer for food, you know, praying for food, prayers, but come on. I mean, I just cut out prayer. And I remember at the end of August, after the Global Leadership Conference, um, it was an amazing conference, but, but I'll tell you, like, I wasn't really there. I was physically there, but not spiritually there. And 
And I remember at the end of August, we went on a double date. Me and Liz and another couple, we went on a double date. We went to the beach and prayed. I remember she prayed first, and then I had the chance to pray. And I remember just being stuck. And I said, God, I don't even know what to say. God, I, I, and I was literally choked up. I couldn't say anything because I hadn't prayed in so long. And Liz was, was just staring at me and like waiting for me to pray. And she begins to cry. And I'm just, I'm just stuck. I was, so, I was so hurt. I was just so just taken back by everything that was going on in my life because I went from hanging out with Ricky every single day to barely seeing him two times a week and barely talking to him every other day. I went from hanging out with Colleen, my spiritual parents. I went from getting comfort from Liz's family and the Latin ministry and different song leading and my, my area in Portland to where I was finally put in a position where everything that was holding me up was then taken out of my life. Everything that was holding to ne- together, everything that was holding me together was like scotch tape just getting taken off, little pieces. And my pride was holding me together that I knew that if I were to begin to pray, I was going to fall all over the place. And I couldn't do it. And that night, I just, I just didn't pray. It just ended the kingdom date. She was in tears. And I was just so hard-hearted. I then get open with Ricky and Colleen. And I was like, guys, like, I'm in a bad spot. Like, my heart is just so hard. I can't even pray. I don't even remember the last time I cried. I, could, I just I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like I'm pleasing people. I don't know what's going on. And, and yet Ricky and Colleen got in there. And I, I started going to the beach every single day trying to practice again, you know. <laughs> Trying to try it again, started singing songs because I didn't even know how to pray. So I didn't even, couldn't even find my own words. So I started singing. Started singing kingdom songs instead. I just started singing, I need your love. And I forgot the lyrics. I got to the second verse and I was like, what? Like, what's, what is it? Like, I literally got stuck in trying to sing kingdom songs. It was so hard, guys. It literally felt like I pull, I was like driving a semi truck down the freeway. And I pull over. Completely stop the car, and then I just make phone calls to my, my business telling them I'm still on the road. And it got so bad, they're like, well, you should have been here already. You should be here. And I tried to start the car, and the engine's not going. I tried to pray. I can't do it. So what I had to do was I had to get behind the semi-truck and literally put it in neutral. I'm trying to start pushing it to get it back up to speed. That's what it felt like trying to pray. And I'll be honest, when, when you pull over, and you stop a semi-truck, and it doesn't start up, and you have to go behind the semi-truck and push it back up to speed, it'll break you. It's going to break you physically. And I had to do that spiritually. So I got broken spiritually. (laughs) I mean, I was just having crazy quiet times. I mean, it, it took a long time, guys. It took months for me to do this. It took months. And yet that's the kind of decision I'm going to call you guys today, is you're either going to walk out of here trying to pray a prayer, and you're going to realize, oh my gosh, I've been pulled over on the side of the road spiritually for a long time. And you're either going to do this. You're going to leave the semi-truck on the side of the road, which is your ride to heaven. So you're going to leave salvation. You're going to leave the kingdom of God. Or you're going to go behind the semi-truck, and you're going to push it until you get broken, until you get your semi-truck back up to speed, and you can be the glow stick, you can be the light that God has called you to be. Amen? <laughs> this woman was not invited. She was broken. And you're here today not because God invited you, but he wants you to be broken. My challenge It's for you to pray with your discipler until you're broken in tears. Pray with your discipler until you're broken in tears. This whole life of Jesus was made for you. So think about this. That hundreds of years of prophecy, hundreds of years of prophecy, just for Jesus to walk the earth, And have 30 years of preparation, three years of public ministry, for three hours of purpose. 
his life on. 30 years of preparation, preparing himself. Three years of public ministry and just for three hours of purpose. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, he suffered on the cross for your sins. He broke himself so that, that by breaking you, if you are broken by your own sin, you can accept the life that he died for. That's it. And yet this woman understood that. She says, only if I break myself. He broke for me in advance so that by breaking myself, my light can shine. His light could shine through me. And that's, that's what we are to Long Beach. You were not saved to come to church on Sunday. You were not saved to sit in a pew. You were not saved for that. You were not saved just to be a stick. You were saved to be a broken stick that by so the light can shine in the darkest places that is for you and for the city of Long Beach. Amen. You guys are the light. Let's go on to verse 40. Jesus calls this man out right here in verse 40. When he said to himself, he just knew what he was thinking. You know, Jesus knows everything you're thinking. He knows your thoughts and your attitudes. Are you with me right here? So he saw her, he saw him judging her. And yet he addresses it and says in verse 40, Jesus answered him. <laughs> he answered his thought. Isn't that incredible? He thought it and he goes, heard that, check this out, bro. Let, tune in. He says, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, about a year's, oh, excuse me, about, uh, yeah, a year's worth of wages. And the other owed him 50, about a month's worth of wages. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? Notice that. He turns toward the woman, but says to Simon. He turns his face to the woman, but gives his correction to the Pharisee, to the spiritual elite. Note that. He says to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. That's crazy, you know, that the Bible even says that the glory of a woman is her hair. She laid her glory down at my feet. And she says in verse 40, you do not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who has been forgiven loves little. The forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. That's crazy. Point number two, broken to be set free. I only have two points for you this morning. Second point, broken to be set free. She was so broken. You know, my sub point is this. In an open field, wearing chains. In an open field, wearing chains. Sometimes your surroundings can deceive you of your freedom. The pride of keeping your chin up can oftentimes take you away from actually seeing your own enslavement. In an open field, wearing chains. She understood that the only source of cleansing was to go to Jesus' feet. To break herself, to be broken. And yet we have to remember that she shamed the Pharisees. You see, we are not the church. We have to remember the church is not a museum for those who are awesome. It's a hospital for the broken. It's not a museum for you to show off. For you to say, this is how I'm doing. I'm awesome. I'm great. Look what God's done. No, it's a hospital for the broken. And yet that's what Jesus offered. That's who Jesus was. Is he was a walking hospital for the broken. So for you to say that you're not broken, that you don't need help, is to say that you don't need Jesus. See, for the rest of my life, I just want to be weak in Christ. 
I just want to be broken every day. You have a broken evangelist this morning. I'm not an awesome evangelist. I'm not a cool evangelist. I might be a longboarding evangelist, but I'm a broken evangelist. I'm broken by my sin. And yet, you have to live in a constant state. Yeah, keep your joy, keep your zeal, keep your fired upness, right? But live spiritually weak. Just be weak in Christ at a constant state of needing more of him. You know, it's interesting because think about this. It said that she just barged right in. This is a nugget. Tune into this. She barged right in and it goes to his feet, right? Think about this. You ever had one of those dinners, like one of those special dinners where it wasn't like paper plates. It was, we're talking like the good china. You know what I mean? Like it was like a, a formal, formal little dinner right there. It was, it was like the good stuff. It was like the Connie Underhill nice china in the glass case right there. Like don't chip the plates. Set them down nicely in the sink. You know what I mean? Uh, like one of those ones. You know what I mean? Um, keep your fork. You know what I mean? So think about that. Imagine if you had a formal dinner like that, and a complete stranger barges in your house, and they start weeping at the feet of your guest of honor. Would you not say, would you not say, what the heck are you, what are you doing? Get this woman out of here. Get this person out of here. What are you doing? Like, you, I mean, get out. I don't even know who you are. What are you doing here? And yet this woman did that to Jesus. She knew exactly where to go. Could it be that this prostitute was not a stranger, but she had been at this house before? That's good preaching, ain't it? That's a nugget. We're talking Real Housewives Jerusalem. <laughs> Episode one. You know what I mean? Like, that's real stuff. And yet, and yet, and yet, they all knew who she was. She, Simon didn't say anything, and none of the other Pharisees said anything. Right? They didn't say, who's this stranger? They said, no, no, no. She was a known sinner. She was a known sinner. And yet, we like brokenness that can't be seen. We like brokenness that nobody can see. You like to cry in secret. You literally take it literally. You have a prayer closet. I mean, you just chill in there. If you're, if you're sad, you have in, in, in your little corner. No, 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 no. This woman was a known sinner. I mean, she was doing it right. I mean, she was just out there. She was just a known sinner. And yet, I guarantee all these, all these Pharisees, that was the kind of stuff they needed to clean inside the cup. Prostitution. Garbage. they known exactly who she was. They all knew who she was. They all sat silent at the table. I know who this woman is. And yet, she didn't come in. Get this. She did not come in saying, hey, Simon's wife, he doesn't really love you. Hey, guys, how's it going? Yeah, yeah, I'm here to get forgiven. You might want to fess up too. No, 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 no. No, no, no. She came not to embarrass anyone else. She came to get set free. She was broken to be set free. And yet many people, many people as Christians, many people want to say, you know what, I, I should get broken. I could get broken. You see, I would get broken if that person fesses up too. I could get broken, I should get broken, I would get broken if that person didn't move away. If that person didn't hurt my feelings, you see, if they repent, I'll repent. And yet, you got to get it in your mind that if you're in sin, if you're enslaved, then you're enslaved. The only slavery that matters on judgment is yours. And yet, she came not to embarrass anyone else. She didn't come in and say like this, and he's in sin, he's in sin, he's a hypocrite, he's a fake. No, no, no. He, she just came in and said, listen, this is where I'm at. This is how I'm doing. And see, you could either woulda, coulda, shoulda got broken. No, you got to make a decision. I will get broken. I will get broken about my sin. And yet many people, their excuses in life, I'm going to hear some excuses. You're going to hear excuses for the rest of your life. There's going to be excuses. Come at the end of May, people are going to say, man, what, what happened? What would you do? Man, it's, I mean... I'm broke. That's what happened. I'm broke. People say, I'm broke. That's why I didn't make it happen. No, 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 no. You're not broken. That's why you didn't make it happen. That's it. You're all without excuse today. This is a call to be broken about your sin. Some of us are enslaved as disciples. Galatians 4 says, listen, you lived enough time. You spend enough time living these weak and miserable principles. 
Do you wish to be enslaved to them all over again? Do you really want that life? Do you want to put back on the chains? Come on. You don't want that. You don't want that. And yet Satan is such a coward. He's a full-on coward. He's listening to this. Satan's a full-on coward. You want to know why? Because Satan is the tough guy that goes after women first. Who was the first woman he tried to attack? The first woman he tried to deceive? Oh, I mean, Eve. He tried to deceive Eve. You see, Satan goes after women first. But Jesus heals women first. He heals women first. He turned to the woman. Turned his face to the woman. But gave correction to the Pharisees. You see, the men are the first ones to get corrected. Amen? Why? Because you're the one leading the woman. What's a prostitute without men to take advantage of her? No job. Why don't you just get yourself a nice husband? Get yourself a regular job. But we got pigs running around trying to take God's daughters for a spin. And yet the leaders, it's always the man's fault. Just know that. It's always your fault. It's always your fault. Every husband, your fault first. Never the wife's fault. Get surrendered to that. I'm learning this in marriage counseling. Your fault. That's why the marriage Debo is going to be the men first, amen? Because they're going to get the rebuke. Like, hey, if your wife's struggling, if, if there's any women around you struggling, it's your fault. You're going to get the correction first. They're going to get the healing first. By the time you heal, they'll get corrected. Because, of course, there comes in the play, okay, listen, you let her get to this state, so you need to get corrected. You need to repent. Okay, I repent. And then it comes to the woman, hey, you were too naive and you gave in to this garbage. Yes, I healed you, but now I need you to repent. God, Jesus Christ, hung out with the broken. He said, you can learn a lesson from this woman, Simon. Why don't you take some notes? You see this? Take some notes. This woman's broken. And yet, the woman in the church got to get broken first. You guys got to get broken first. You guys, my sisters, my mothers, my, my daughters in the faith. If you guys don't get broken, we can't get corrected. We can't protect you. Every sister needs to live in a constantly broken state needing Jesus. I want to I encourage you as women. Be broken every single day. Just, just be weak in Christ. The world today wants to sell you a lie that as women, you need to be tough, that you need to stand up. You need to have a voice. No, you just need to say nothing. There were no words needed. She didn't say one word. There was no words needed for this woman. She just said, <laughs> you know, that was it. And Jesus said, that's enough for me. Simon, listen. That's it. That would make sense. Women got to be silent in the church because they're broken and cherished. It's not shut up. It's cherished. It's not shut up. No. If you're cherished and you're broken, you're in a constant state of needing Jesus Christ, needing protection. And that is who the women are in this church. And that is who the brothers vow to be. Are you with me right here? Broken to be set free. Broken to be set free. If you made a decision, you say, you know, I would get broken if these guys wouldn't have used me. I would get broken if this person didn't hurt me. I would get broken if we changed some things in the church. No. You see... You can have the greatest leadership, but if you're not broken as an individual, you're a failure. Judas had the best pastor, the best leader, the best evangelist, the best speaker, the coolest guy in the world, and yet he betrayed him. See, it's not leadership why the sisters can't repent. 
It's your own sin. She made the decision. This is what I'm going to be. And you've got to make a decision. Where am I going to be in five years? Am I going to be protected in the kingdom of God? Am I going to stay broken to keep my light shining? You've got to realize the women, the smiles in the church, the radiance in the church is from the women. That's it. Not fired up women, not fired up church. Period. I have no reason to be fired up if you're not fired up. And yet Satan's a full-on coward. He goes after the weaker partner, except being the weaker partner. A lot of women, they want to be the better co-leader. They want to be the stronger co-leader. Don't do that. Be the weaker one. Be the humble one. Say, no, no, listen, I'm willing to be taught. I want to learn. I'm here to sit at your feet. I don't know more than you. I don't know. That. No, I'm not here to. She said, no. She didn't even have to say teacher. She, could, she knew that it was her teacher from eye contact. He knew she was the student. There she is. That's all I need to see is your brokenness. Let us protect you guys. And the men need to step up. The men need to step up. We have sisters battling with insecurity, battling with impurity, battling with thoughts of falling away, battling with, with giving what they, are, they vowed. They're struggling because they're being attacked by the coward. They're being attacked by Satan. And God's going to correct you. God's going to correct the dudes. God's going to correct the men. And, and yet Satan's ticked off because I'm exposing this. He doesn't care about me sugarcoating everything. He cares when he gets exposed. Satan's a full-on coward. Never forget it. He's a coward. He's a deceitful man. I raise my hand. I say, put me on your hit list, Satan. I'm going on the hit list today, guys. And so are you because you're going to get broken. You're going to get broken to be set free. You know, I think a woman that lifts, that totally exemplifies this is my fiance, yes. Liz is, is, as many of us know, has got to be like the sweetest girl in, in the whole world, you know. Uh, I think of Liz as, as like a, as a dandelion fly, uh, a flower. You know, her last name's Flores. But I think of her as like a dandelion flower. You know, you can't, you can't move it around too much, otherwise it's going to blow. It's going to, you know, because she's so gentle um, and so sweet. And so I feel like every D time with her is like walking a dandelion across New York City in the wind. <laughs> I got to be so careful, you know what I mean? I got to protect her. And, and I just got to say, like, my, one of my favorite times in the week is, is, is our discipling time on Tuesdays. And we just spend such good time together. We spend quality time. We, we get into the word. I have a good Bible study with her. I, I get in her heart. Now, I want to encourage you. This is how you're going to help the women for the rest of your life. You ask them, how are you doing? No, no, no. Not how's your ministry, not how are the sisters, how are you? How is your health? Right? How's your health? How's your sleep? How's your fun? How's your activities? And here's the key. Check this out. Listen. Listen. Don't jump. Just, just, just kick it for a second. Just kick it. Recline at the table and listen. Are you with me right here? You take a listen. Here's a second question. And then you ask, okay, how's your relationship with God? Because oftentimes when they can reflect on how their the life is going, they can reflect how much they've been relying on God through it all. So you ask that. This needs to be constant fellowship questions, guys. Constant fellowship. Then you ask, okay, how's the women in your ministry? How's your relationship with God? How's your prayer life? How's this and that going? And then here's the tough one. This is the one I get stumped on every single time in our D time. This is the, one, this is the hard one. How do you think I'm doing? Here's me right here. That's the tough one. And here's the key. Shut up and listen. You right here. Oh, that's what I'm doing. Oh, man. Because the women will really tell you where it's at. The women really know. See, an emo the emotional imbalance of an individual comes from the opposite sex. We got to have better brother and sister relationships in the church. You got to spur each other on. We got too many guys trying to bark at too many other guys like, get your stuff in, man. Hit your bow, this and that. And like, man, I'm not motivated at all. But if a sister came in and said, so, bro, I heard that your, your goal was 1200 How much do you have turned in? Well, that's convicting. I have 100 bucks turned in. All of a sudden, hey, man, bro, bro, come on, it's fine. That's a good talk right there. That's a good talk. That's a good talk. We got to have more of those. We got to have brothers going up to sisters like, hey, sis, I mean, how's it going? I mean, how's, how's it going on campus? How many Bible studies do you have? Who are you reaching out to? Right? 
oh, that's kind of a thing. I mean, usually I'm getting asked that when I'm discipled, but, I mean, you're like my interest, so I got to, I got, don't tell him that, but you're like, but you're like, you're a little bit like, man, I mean, okay, I got to give a vow and get a good answer right here. Oh, you know what? He's got to, he can't lie. You can't lie, and yet the protection relationship's got to grow in the church, and that's the kind of thing I have with Liz, is that she constantly is willing to give it to me straight. She, she, she always gives it to me real. She says, this is how I'm really doing, and this is, this is how I want to be. And she looks at me like I can help her, and it's only the inspiration to make me want to help her. And every single week, I, I'm able to give her my best. Because I feel needed and she feels held. And yet Jesus paints an example of the broken. Of who we need to be as men. Is not tough guys, hypocrites. No, no, no. Empathetic, sympathetic men that say, she didn't even have to say any words. He just looked at her and said, baby, I understand. I, I get it. I get it, sweetie. I get it. I'm broken too. I'm broken too. Take my hand. I'm going to lead you through this. Take my hand. Your sins are forgiven. Mark 2.10 said Jesus had authority on earth to forgive sins. Now, today, if you're visiting with us, how are you going to get forgiven? It's not by, Jesus isn't on earth. He doesn't have ability to forgive sins anymore. You know what I mean? He painted, he, give, he died on the cross for our sins. Those three hours of purpose, died on the cross for our sins, so that, Romans 6 says, by participating in the death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus Christ, which is that baptism, Acts 2.38, right? Acts 2.38 says you get the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Your soul breaks because it was broken at the cross and you can be like a glow stick bright when you're broken. Amen? I want to look like this for the rest of my life. Maybe a little bit bigger. I'm a small, you know? But I want to be broken for the rest of my life. You want to be broken for the rest of your life. You got to live to break the hearts around you you got to live to break other people. And yet, Liz is the one who breaks my heart. I can't imagine hurting Liz. I can't imagine it. I, I serve to make sure she never is broken by any kind of sin again. I live to protect her. My challenge, guys, is to help set someone else free by our congregational service next week. Help set someone else free. You gotta ask yourself, when was the last time you helped set someone free? When was the last time you helped someone get set free? Because you gotta reflect. If I haven't set someone free in a while, probably because I'm a tiny bit enslaved. You can't unlock anyone else's handcuffs if you're wearing them. Are you with me right here? And all it is is if you haven't helped somebody get set free, if you haven't been setting people free, it's because you've begun to get a little bit more enslaved. Are any of you enslaved this morning? And do any of you want to be set free? Broken to be set free. You got to make that decision. Make that decision. Listen, God did not come to your jail cell, open it up, give you the keys so that you could run out of the jail. No. He opened up your jail cell at this time, at this point in time in your life, to take the keys and go open up the rest of the doors to the rest of the people's lives around you to set them free as well. That's your purpose in life. That's your purpose in life. And yet we don't realize that why would Jesus have the keys? Why would Jesus be in the jail? Because he already locked up Satan. You don't have to run. Many people get the keys and they get out of the jail cell and they're like, man, the guards are going to get me. No, 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 Satan and all of his demons have nothing on you. He already died on the cross. He already locked them up. He already tied up the burglar. And he gave you the keys and said, listen, if you just go around, I'm just, I, I opened your door because I know you're going to get this done. I know this is going to be a joy for you. Here's my life because I see that you are broken. Take the keys and go unlock every other jail cell. 
And yet if you're still in your jail cell, you can't help anybody else. The only way to get out is by taking everything that's been holding you together and lay it at Jesus' feet. What is that going to require? What is that gonna, what's going to happen at that point? When you take everything that's holding you together, and the moment you take it off you and let it go, and give it to Jesus, everything that was holding you together now is not, you're literally going to fall apart in front of Jesus' feet. That's what you want. And that's what we're going to go after. There's so many things, guys, and I believe that the source is brokenness. The source is brokenness this morning. I could preach great faith. I could preach great knowledge. I could preach passion. I could preach whatever I want. But if I'm preaching to a crowd of hard hearts, if I'm preaching to a group of Pharisees, it means nothing. And yet Jesus was reclining with people who were not broken, and it was a woman who gave the example. A woman gave the example of what it meant to be broken. She said, I want to be a glow stick because I know that they're better when broken. They're better when they're broken. There's no purpose when they're not. What's a, what's a, what's a glow stick without it being broken? And yet that's who you want to be this morning. That's who you want to be as man. You get to be a glow stick. You are a glow stick. You got broken. Sometimes these things get cold. You put them in the freezer, and all you got to do is recrack them, and they, they, should, they shine up again. Isn't that amazing? So you might need to refresh yourself, right? Get yourself some good refreshment. Pull yourself out. Crack together. And you're good. You're good to go. You'll be nice and bright again. Guys, that's what you want. But first, you got to get broken. You got to get broken about your sin. My challenge from point number one was pray with your discipler until you're broken. Broken so you can see. Pray with your discipler until you shed tears. Because only then can you have a clarity of mind with the sin you've committed. You have to ask yourself do I want to be a glare? Or do I want to glow? Point number two is broken to be set free. I don't want to be in an open field with a straight jacket on. I don't want to deceive myself. No, I don't want to just be bouncing around the field like, look at how the lilies of the field grow. Isn't that labor spin? And yet I'm still enslaved. No, I don't want that. I don't want that life. I want to live set free and you want to live set free. The only way we can do that is if we let our light shine. But you must understand, you could get broken. Anybody can get broken. You could get broken. We all have sin. You could get broken. Here's the kicker. Let me convince you, if you're not already convinced, you should get broken. Because if you don't get broken, God's going to break you. And then you say, well, I would get broken. Remove those excuses. Say, it's not about anybody else. It's about me. Okay, I know that I shoulda, woulda, coulda got broken, but I didn't. So now I'm in a hell. I don't want that. No, I coulda got broken. I shoulda got broken. It's not that I would have got broken. I will get broken. And by getting broken, you can be a glow stick like a disciple because they're brightest when they're broken. And to God be the glory. Glow sticks are like disciples. Colin, brighter when broken.